Visualization is one of the most effective ways to explore a point data set. The unique nature of points without any dimension, just a pair of coordinates, creates a host of possibilities to visualize point data sets. However, modern data sets with large amounts of points also create some challenges. So in this clip, we're going to have a look at what are some of the options focusing on their uh, limitations, but also on their opportunities that they create. Let's have a look at the slides. We're going to explore three main visualization routes for visualizing point patterns today. The first one we will call one-to-one -one mapping. The second one relies on aggregation into an ancillary or auxiliary geography. And then the third one relies on smoothing techniques. And to better conceptualize and frame these three options and these three routes that we have, there's a counterpart of each of them, or here are some mental counterparts that you can um, use to help you understand these routes better. One-to-one -one mapping, it's akin to a scatter plot. In fact, it is a scatter plot where the uh, two variables were, dist were plotting are co geographical coordinates. Aggregation, it's akin to the histogram. And as we will see, it has a lot of parallels and has a lot of opportunity for using what we learned about choroplets in a previous blog. And then the third one, the smoothing, is really a two-dimensional extension of kernel density estimates that try to fit a smooth version of or an empirical version of the probability curve of a variable into a two-dimensional setting where we're trying to estimate an empirical probability surface. Let's look at each of them one by one. The first one is what I call the one-to-one -one mapping. This is the most straightforward and is fairly intuitive because for every point in the data set, we're drawing a single point in the, on the screen or on the map. And it's very effective in small data sets, mostly because it's, it's intuitive. It's an easy to communicate idea on how you are displaying a point data set. For every row in your data set, you have a point in your map. It's a one-to-one -one mapping that is easy to understand and very effective. However, it's only effective on small data sets. And when the size of our data grows, it starts becoming less and less effective. The reason is that at some point, when the size of your data set grows, an area of concentration of points becomes very hard to discern how many points are being drawn on the screen. And particularly when you think of some of the new forms of data that we discussed very early in this course, the data sets of points that we can get grow to very large sizes, even to some point, to, to some cases where there's more points than pixels in our screen, in the screen of our computer. And then when we get to that stage, it is very hard. Well, visualization loses all of its appeal because it's, it's not possible to understand the distribution of points. All we see is a blurb of the color that we've decided to give to the point. And it's really hard to discern what is the intensity of events. Remember that when we're plotting points, we're really, in this context, looking at events that happen in particular locations. When we have too many points to plot in a particular area, it's really hard to see the intensity of those of that event happening. But remember, when you don't have a lot of uh, points, this is a very effective way. And here is an example um, with a small subset of, of tweets in Liverpool. The second route, which it's an alternative when we start hitting the limits of the previous approach of the one-to-one, -one, is aggrega aggregation. The key idea here is this meeting point or this merging of points with everything we've learned about polygons. And the intuition be behind this approach is to use a polygon boundary to count how many points that are in every area, in every polygon. And then once we've uh, created a count data set at the polygon layer, at the polygon level, once we've aggregated our point data set into polygons by counting how many points there are in a given polygon, everything we've learned about choroplets can be applied here. 
because in fact what we have is no longer a point data set is a polygon data set with a count variable however there are some drawbacks to this approach is that and most of them relate to this idea that the polygon layer we use to aggregate our point data set uh, our original point data set needs to make sense or in other words the delineation, the, the segmentation of space and the geography that this polygon layer brings in and we use to count points needs to be somewhat aligned with the um, underlying process that generated the point pattern. This is very important. We need to, to be able to match the process that generates the points that we're using with the geography that the polygon layer um, encapsulates. Other, and here is an example where we have um, the same point data set that we showed before, but then we aggregate it at the MSOA or at the LSOA uh, level. In other words, at, the, at, a, at a polygon um, geography provided by the census or the Office of Statistics. An alternative route that we can take to aggregate our point data set is to, instead of using a a particular geography like that from the census, we can layer a uniform grid. And this grid can be of different shapes, but the point here, the idea is that if we don't have a good candidate geography, remember that this geography needs to match um, the underlying point pattern. If we don't have that geography, it might be more convenient or more effective to use uh, a tessellation, a, a, hex, a uniform grid. And that tessellation can be hexagonal, that is based on hexagons of the same size, or square, based on, on a grid of, of squares. More modern approaches tend to favor the hexagonal approach, the hexagonal tessellation over the square, although depending on the application, the square might be more, more um, more favorable. Why hexagons? Well, hexagons are regular, same as squares in this sense. They exhaust the space, and this is, for example, unlike a geography of circles or overlapping circles, and they, don't, they have many sides, but not only do they have many sides, but each boundary, remember when we were discussing con contiguity in the context of spatial weights matrices, each neighbor is connected in terms of contiguity with every other uh, hexagon through, by the same intensity in terms of boundary sharing. Every neighbor will share the same length of segment as anyone, any other hexagon. This is not the same potentially with a square tessellation. Remember, if we were using queen contiguity, we will designate as, neighbor, as neighbors of a given square every other square that shared at least a single point with that square. And that created two types of neighbors, those who share an entire segment and those who share a single point. That doesn't happen with, with hexagon geographies. Here is an example, again, with the same geography of points that we've been using for the illustration. And then we come up with an additional, our um, auxiliary geography in this case is a, a grid tessellation of hexagons and what we do is connect every point to the hexagon where they fall into, count how many points there are in every hexagon and then encode those counts in a color gradient following choropleth rules and this is what we arrive at. However, this approach of the general uh, However, this approach of aggregating points into polygons is effective and it's very computationally um, efficient because once you've aggregated into the polygon layer, you don't have a potentially very large set of points. You have a set of polygons with counts. That can speed up computations a lot, but there are drawbacks. Here is a couple. The first one I've alluded to that, but here to make it very explicit, there's a very clear risk of running into the modifiable aerial unit problem. Remember what we discussed in block D, how the how aggregation or the choice of geography that you use to count 
single events or points in this case can very uh, significantly affect the final conclusions that you draw in your analysis. This is very, very much present when we aggregate points into polygons. And this is why, ideally, if you have a good geography to aggregate it into, it's a good strategy. But if you don't, you either use a very fine-grained uniform one, like we've seen with, with grids, or you take a different approach. Because the, the risk of running into serious consequences with the MAUP is very important and very present. The second drawback of this approach, which it's important to always keep in mind too, is that points usually represent events that affect only part of a population. And then usually when we're, and this actually doesn't only relate to the polygon layer, it also relates to the one-to-one -one mapping. And this is generally uh, relate to as the underlying population issue in the sense that when you're looking at certain events, like crime, for example, crimes for a crime to happen, there needs to be, for example, for a robbery to happen, there needs to be something to rob. So the geography of robberies is very closely connected to the geography of places that can be robbed. And that is sometimes, or in most cases, not uniformly spread over space. So if we display only robberies, we run into a very good... Uh, chance or risk of displaying actually much more the underlying population of places that may be robbed rather than those that are uh, robbed that actually get a receive a robbery. So it's always important to keep in mind when you're visualizing points, what is the underlying population that the events they represent um, may relate to and how the underlying distribution of that population may affect the distribution of the events that we are visualizing. This is important when we're uh, visualizing points aggregated in polygons, but also when we're visualizing one-to-one uh, -one mappings. And in fact, when we're visualizing almost any type of point pattern. The third and final approach we want to review today is what I call what is called kernel density estimation, or KDE. KDE tries to estimate the continuous observed distribution of a variable. So rather than thinking of events as single discrete uh, occurrences, what, it, what KDEs try to do is shift the view from discrete events into an underlying statistical process or statistical uh, probability that generates these events. So the events are discrete, but the underlying process is uh, continuous, is a surface of probability that determines which parts of the map are more likely to uh, receive or to, 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 rec yeah, to receive one of these events. KDEs are still a, vi a way of vis uh, a visualization tool, but they are one step further into the uh, modeling of the underlying processes. Remember that we said point pattern analysis as a discipline is about exploring, visualizing, and then modeling um, the generation of point patterns. KDEs are still a visualization. They're a great tool for exploring the distribution of, of points, but they're also a hint into um, the underlying models. And in particular, they're a hint into a probabilistic view into models, because rather than understanding a point pattern as a collection of individual events, what they try to do is abstract away that collection of individual events into a function, a probability function that generates a surface of frequencies or a surface of probabilities of where or, or of locations that have that are more likely or less likely to receive uh, events from this pattern that we or this process that we're analyzing. So in, in one way, they're a more sophisticated um, way of visualizing points. They represent, once estimated, they represent the probability of finding an observation at a given location. And this implicitly means that they are a continuous surface. Of uh, of values, they aren't uh, a discrete set of 
of, of events that are continuous surface that represents the probability of finding an observation in any given point of the geography that we're interested in. You can almost think of them as a continuous version of a histogram. And to some extent, although not entirely, but to some extent, they solve the problem of the MAUP, of the modifiable aerial unit problem, because they work around the necessity of having to find a unit into which to aggregate um, points. So unlike the previous round that we saw where we were aggregating and counting points by polygons, here you're not counting by any discrete uh, segmentation of the geography. You're not overlaying a specific geography of polygons. You're smoothing the distribution of points into a continuous surface. And to a certain extent, although not perfectly, um, KDEs do get around the MAUP. Here is an example of a kernel density estimate on a single dimension. So when we have uh, a collection of values, not points, or, or values with a single coordinate. And then I want to spend a little bit of time here so you get the understanding of, uh, the, of the mechanism that kernel density estimates do have. And then for the spatial case, we're going to generalize into two dimensions. But let's focus on the a single dimension first. Imagine that we have a data set here. Let's focus on the left first. A set of points that are distributed across this value range. They go somewhere between minus uh, four all the way into seven. And we are, um, this is a very simple data set of six points. Here's one, two, three, four, five, and six. And we have a couple of values that are in, we have three values in the negative um, side of the range and three in the positive ones. The negative ones are all in this area. And this means that when we create the histogram, they all fall within this bin. And hence, this bin is larger. Now, the uh, second, well, the, the positive values are more spread. And then this generates a histogram that has a a top peak here and two lower ones here. Now, the important thing I want to focus in this context is when we create a histogram, we have to split, and this is similar to how we were doing choropleth classification, we have to split the value range into discrete bins. And in each bin, we count how many points we have, even though it's on a single dimension, and we encode that count in the height of the bar. But for the um, for the count of the bin in this area here, it's irrelevant that there is a point right next to it because it's mutually, it's completely exclusive of each other. So if a point is assigned into a bin, it doesn't affect the count of any other bin. It only affects the count of that bin. So in this case, See, this point falls within this bin and then hence contributes to the count of this bar, even though it's right next to this other bin, which doesn't have any point and hence has a zero. It doesn't have a bar. This is the, the main difference between histograms and kernel density estimates. Kernel density estimates are a smooth version of a histogram. You can think of them as a smooth version of a histogram. So here we have the same data set, the same six points. And what we're doing is creating what is called in statistics a kernel, which is a function that is placed on several locations. Sometimes it's placed on the same, on the actual point. Sometimes it's, uh, it's spread across a, a um, uniform set of locations. And then around those locations, they count how many points fall within a radius, but they also weight differently based on distance. So, and this is what we would call the, the kernel estimate, the kernel function, which gives more weight to points that are closer and less weight to points that are further apart. And each of these smoothed counts, 
are then aggregated into a single one, which is represented here with a blue line. And it's an aggregation of the count, which is, well, it's translated into a probability um, measurement that for each of these individual kernels that then is aggregated into a single one in a way that areas that where different kernels are given um, more weight to more points because there are more points in those areas, they're aggregated into or they translate into a higher probability in the blue line here. While areas with less uh, presence of points, they don't have a zero because it's still a smooth version, um, so they don't have a zero like they had on the histogram, but they have a lower probability. Now, this is an example on a one dimension, but this same intuition can be applied to a two dimensional type of kernel density estimate. And this is what's known as the bivariate KDE. This is the probability, or this captures the probability of finding observations at a given point on a, of a two dimensional space. And we can use this tool to understand geographical locations of points because ultimately all we need is pairs of coordinates. In our case, they might be geographical coordinates, but the technique works exactly in uh, the case of non-geographical coordinates. So it's a bivariate version. We're modeling or we're, we're trying to abstract away and smooth the distribution, not of single values as in the previous slide, but of pairs of values, of locations in a two-dimensional space or a geography. And in, when, we're, when these locations are, actual, are geographical locations, then these are coordinates, um, and they could be latitude and longitude or any um, projected equivalent. And in the same way that a one-dimensional KDE, like in the previous slide, is a, a smooth and continuous version of a histogram, bivariate KDEs can also be somewhat understood as a smooth version of a choropleth, of a smooth version of a map where we've aggregated point locations into uh, discrete partitions of space or, or polygons, as we've seen before. So here is an example of what a bivariate KD looks like. And to aid your interpretation, each of the two dimensions, so we have a set of points that have two coordinates, one along the expressed along the x-axis, one along the y-axis. To aid your interpretation, you can think of the distribution of points along each of these dimensions individually as expressed as a one-dimensional KDE. And it's the combination of the two where these two meet that we can create a, a surface, a probability surface, that gives you the probability of finding points at a given location in a two-dimensional space. Going back to the previous example with the point in the city center of Liverpool that we had, the equivalent, um, well, the KD, the bivariate KD that we would create is this one, or one of the KDs that we could create would be this one. It's a smooth version that, in this case, tells us there's a higher probability of finding points around this location than, say, around this one. 